Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, the Honorable Jim Renacci, representative of Ohio's 16th Congressional District. Congressman Renacci comes to the City Club podium two days after Congress, in an ongoing partisan environment, avoided a crisis of its own creation by lifting the debt ceiling until March 2015. First, the House approved the measure with only 28 Republicans voting in favor. Then the focus shifted to the Senate, where Senate Republicans broke their own party's filibuster to allow what ended up being a party line vote. On the House vote, a New York Times story yesterday stated that, quote, for a bill to pass the House with such scant support from the party in control, most members of the Republican majority had to quietly want to pass it to avoid the real world consequences an economy rattling default while being able to vote against it to jo dodge a backlash from conservative activists threatening repercussions. End of a uh, rather long quote. So with that backdrop, and I sh should say that in the essence of a vibrant democracy, people may have different views on whether that's a proper characterization, but I'd like to say a few words about our speaker, who was among the 199 House Republicans who voted against raising the debt limit. He was born in Monongahela, Pennsylvania, a city just south of Pittsburgh. The congressman was the first member of his family to graduate from college, earning his bachelor's degree in business administration from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He became a certified public accountant and worked for an accounting firm in Pittsburgh, and later moved on to Wadsworth, Ohio, just south of Cleveland, where he founded a company that owned, operated, and managed nursing facilities. He served as mayor of Wadsworth from 2004 to 2008 and later formed a CPA firm. He has 30 years, 30 years of experience in business and is highly respected both for his business acumen and his successes and for his commitment to public service, which included, in addition to his mayoral stint in Wadsworth, five years as a volunteer firefighter there. Congressman Renacci was elected as representative of the 16th District in 2010 and then again in 2012. As a congressman, he has worked to forge collaborative relationships across the aisle, including teaming with Democratic Congressman John Carney from Delaware to have breakfast club meetings to create casual camaraderie. And in response to President Obama's January 28th State of the Union address, Congressman Renacci stated, quote, at a time when we are facing serious challenges, it is more important now than ever that Congress and the President work together. I look forward to working with the President and my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to restore economic stability so that we may pass on a better America." End of quote. I am proud and pleased to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Congressman Jim Renacci, representative of Ohio's 16th Congressional District. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. And thank you, Paul, for that introduction. I've got my book here, which I'm not going to follow. I can tell you I have a great staff. They give me these notes. Uh, but they also know that I go off camera, which I'm going to do after I uh, go into a few uh, comments here. Uh, of course, I'm proud to be the representative of Ohio's 16th District. For many of you that aren't aware, that includes Cuyahoga County, Portage, Summit, Stark, Wayne, in Medina County. So um, I went from the old 16th district, which used to just have Wayne, Stark, Medina, and part of Ashland, now has blossomed. But it's a great district, and I'm happy to be able to serve uh, Cuyahoga County and the 16th district. Uh, people of 16th district are really one of the greatest resources for me, and I'm so proud to, uh, to be able to represent them in Washington, D.C. Uh, before I begin this afternoon, though, I do want to recognize a few folks in the audience. Um, Representative Nan Baker is here. Representative Mike Davila. <laughs> Senator Frank LaRose. <laughs> Cuyahoga County Councilman uh, Dave Greenspan's here. <laughs> Sean Brennan, President of Parma City Council, who brought several students from the Brexville Broadview High School. Daniel Witter and Dylan Michael, students from Walsh University are here this afternoon who are part of a, uh, 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 I have a program down there at Walsh to try and get people more involved in uh, the political world. So they're here. 
And I'd also like to recognize Charles Bolton and thank him for sponsoring today's event in the name of his family. And if <laughs> thank you so much. And for anyone who I have neglected to recognize, again, thank you for being here. And thank everyone, really, for being here today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, you heard a little bit about me. I mean, I came from western Pennsylvania. Uh, grandfather was a coal miner. Uh, mother was a nurse. Father was a railroad worker. Those were really the values that I grew up with and really the values that I brought with me to Ohio 30 years ago. Um, as you heard, I was the first person to go to college uh, in my family, paid for it my own way. I mean, I actually drove a tractor trailer truck. I drove, uh, I worked on a road crew. I did all the things necessary to get through school and I was very proud of that. And it was a great opportunity for me to be the first to graduate from college and then um, I was always wanted to be a police officer uh, coming out of high school and going to college. And when I got into college, I realized that uh, criminology classes weren't as easy for me as business management and accounting were. So uh, I quickly turned to that and graduated with a business degree at, with, at Indiana University of Pennsylvania in business uh, management and administration. I got my CPA and took a job in uh, Pittsburgh, actually, for the first three years of my career, Grant Thornton. And at Grant Thornton, I quickly rose because I always set goals. I'm a big believer in goals. My staff will tell you who's here that, uh, you know, a ship out in the middle of the ocean without a goal of going anywhere is a ship without a rudder going nowhere. Uh, so from day one, I always said, I'm going to be a CPA. And then when I got to the CPA firm, I figured out what would it take to be the manager of that CPA firm. So I realized I had to bring in more business. I became the only person that wanted to take on the nursing home ministry and be part of it in Pittsburgh. I still remember the day they said, well, we have all these new clients in Ohio. Um, who are we going to get to do it? And somebody said, I get the new guy, Renacy. Just let him do it. Uh, so anyway, it ended up being a great experience for me because I became the healthcare expert in a large CPA firm after three years. And quite frankly, was happy to be in Pittsburgh. And then I had an opportunity to come here to Ohio where I started a business with just a couple hundred dollars in a bank and really built that business to where I owned and operated at one point in time 23 facilities in this great state of Ohio, all the way from the Cincinnati area all the way up to Youngstown. So 23 uh, nursing facilities. But not only did I have the facilities, <coughs> I had anything related to health care. So I had a pharmacy company, I had a medical supply company, anything related to that chain. Um, and then I turned around and sold that business and realized but there were a lot of other businesses out there that uh, I'd like to get involved in. So my career grew from there. I started to, uh, I got involved in a golf course, I got involved in arena football, I got involved in minor league baseball, and the list goes on and on and on <laughs> because I really did like sports. But all of those relationships and all those businesses gave me just a great opportunity to realize what a great country we have and what great opportunities we have. And you know the, the interesting thing? All of those businesses, I could never tell you, we were very successful, I could never tell you where my, whether my partners or my associates were Democrats or Republicans, because I didn't really care. We had a common goal. Common goal was to be the best we could be, whether it was in healthcare, the best we could be, whether it was on the football field and arena football, the best we could be in base, on the baseball team. All of those things were the common goal, and it didn't matter whether there was a Republican sitting next to me or a Democrat sitting next to me or an Independent sitting next to me. It was all about a common goal. So some people would say, <clears throat> you're in this business world, what made you run for Congress? Well, you did hear that I gave back a lot to my community. I was part of um, the fire department for five years. I always believed in giving back. Uh, I was on the planning commission. I was on the Zor Board of Zoning Appeals because the Democrat mayor at the time asked me to do those things. Uh, I then ran for president of city council because mem people in the city wanted me to run for city council. And I, I said no a number of times, and they kept asking, kept asking. Any of you in politics know sometimes you keep saying no, and eventually you end up doing it. I ended up doing that. And then I realized that I had a goal in the city, and that was to balance that budget. I didn't want to be there just to be a po politician. I didn't want to be the mayor or the city council president for the rest of my life. I wanted to do what I did best in business. And that was to get in, get it fixed, and get out. And quite frankly, that's what I did as mayor. I said, I'm going to be, become the mayor. I'm going to balance the budget. I'm going to leave the city better than it was when I got there. And then I'm going to move on. 
And quite frankly, that's what I did. I was able to take the city on, on with a couple million dollars worth of deficits, <laughs> $80 million budget, converted the city from a, um, a deficit to a surplus without raising taxes, and turned around and said, I'm done. I'm done with politics. And I went back and I started running my car dealership. I started running my uh, couple other businesses I still had. And I was content just to give politics up. That was 18 years of service back to my community, which I thought was enough. Then all of a sudden, one day, the General Motors story comes up. And I find out that my dealership, which I really took over in the city of Wadsworth to actually be part of the city of Wadsworth, I found out my dealership was potentially in jeopardy. Now, I was told it wasn't, but on that day in 2009, I'll never forget, I got a certified letter that basically said, you are no longer going to be part of the General Motor family. That was a turning point in my life, and really it should be a turning point in everybody's life when you realize the government can get so big, they can basically come into your life and take something away from you. And that's what they did. Now people will say, well that was General Motors. And quite frankly, it was General Motors. But you also got to remember the administration at the time stepped in. There were the car czars. They're the ones who made the decisions on who stayed and who went. And I never really understood why my dealership was taken away. But the one thing I realized that the government was getting too big, that was one of the darkest days, in my opinion, in America. And quite frankly, I thought it was the first time that I saw the American dream getting away. Remember, I'm a, I'm a product of the American dream. Started with nothing, grew up in a family that had nothing, wore my neighbor's hand-me-down clothes, but realized that you could always achieve something in this country if you worked hard, did the right things, and were willing to put in the time. And that's what I did. But I saw all of a sudden something being taken away from me, and that was very disturbing. <clears throat> so ultimately, that was my reason for running for Congress. And I ran not knowing what it meant to get on a national stage in Congress, and I ended up winning the election. And then I said, uh-oh, now I'm here. <laughs> and the answer to that was, now what are we going to do to fix things? And that's where I really start to put back all my basic principles that I learned in my career. First off, I don't care whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I want to work with you. Secondly, we got to get some things accomplished. And third, we got to quit throwing stones at each other. And I'll never forget, um, I, my greatest learning le experience in, in Washington was <clears throat> I walked up to a Democrat at a dinner. I was probably only there a couple weeks. And I said to him, you know, you've been here for 20 years. Maybe I can learn something from you. And I reached out my hand and I says, maybe you can tell me a little bit about your opinion of the debts and the deficits and what we need to do different. And he took my hand and he said, when you morons get out of the way, we'll be able to fix things. Now I'll tell you, that was the best learning experience for me. Because what I realized was, well first off, I was a little shocked I got called a moron. Um, <laughs> but what I really realized was that we have people from all over the country and they think different. So when you have 435 people, I finally realized this individual was from a very liberal part of the country that he thought 100% different than I did. And that's okay. We've got to be able to work together. So it was a great learning experience for me because it gave me the opportunity to say, now I realize we've got to work together. And by the way, that guy's one of my friends, one of my good friends right now in, in Washington. So it shows you when you're willing to work with people across the aisle. Next thing I learned is I got into my first hearing. I was uh, lucky to be put on the Financial Services Committee, one of the four strong committees in Congress. And I noticed that the first thing everybody did on financial services where they, where they did these opening remarks. Now I'm sitting there in the, in the lower row and I keep hearing the Republican throwing stones at the Democrat and the Democrat getting his five minutes and throwing stones at the Republican and then they'd finally come to me. I mean this would go back and forth and back and forth and I thought what a ridiculous thing. So they'd come to me and I would just pass because I didn't believe that was getting us anywhere. In fact one, at one point in time I still remember Looking down, I finally had the chance to talk, and I said, you know, I thought this hearing was about X, Y, and Z, whatever it was. And I says, I think that's what we're, we have witnesses here, and maybe we should hear what they have to say. So I then started asking questions of the witnesses. And it didn't talk, I didn't talk about Republicans, I didn't talk about Democrats, 
They talked about issues. Because let's face it, the problems in our country aren't Republican issues, they're not Democrat issues, they're American issues, and they're things we all have to be willing to work together on. And what I learned right away was a couple members on the other side noticed that. And after a couple meetings, I had one member walk up to me after a meeting. It was, his name was John Coney from Delaware. I'll never forget this. He said to me, he was a Democrat. He said, you know, there's a couple of us over there really like you. <laughs> you know, the reason we like you is you're not throwing any stones. You're not throwing hand grenades. You're actually willing to try and work to get something done. And I said, well, that's great. I appreciate you stopping over. It's, I said, maybe we should have breakfast someday. And he said, great. So, we had breakfast, he and I talked, and when I finally realized after talking to him, he wasn't much different than I was. Of course, he was a Democrat, but it didn't matter. He knew we were spending too much money, he knew our debt was growing too high, and he knew we had to work together. So I said to him, well, do you have any friends that feel the same way? And he said, sure. And I said, well, so do I. So next meeting, I brought a couple, he brought a couple, we had a breakfast about three weeks later, and those breakfasts started to grow. And the next thing you know on the house floor, people started to say, can I get in that club? Can I get in that group? The problem is, when you get too many people in a group, you don't get a lot accomplished. So John and I sat down one day and says, let's keep the group small. Let's not make it a caucus. Let's not make it official. Let's make it informal. And that's what we did. So the first goal was to have 12 members, six Republicans and six Democrats, to meet every few weeks and to try and get some things accomplished. Then we moved that up, because we realized people had schedules you couldn't make every meeting. And uh, ultimately, that group now has grown to approximately 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats. We meet about every two to three weeks. We just had a meeting uh, this past Tuesday morning. The agenda is pretty simple. Number one, we always talk about things we can do together and accomplish together. Number two, politics stay out of the room. And number three, we talk about current events and what's really happening today in the, in the House. And it's enlightening because, quite frankly, you know, when you're sitting around with Republicans, most of the time you hear their side, it's sometimes very good to sit around with the Democrats and hear their side. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, doesn't mean you have to change your position, but at least you understand better what they're thinking. And we have been able to come up with some very good pieces of legislation and get those out onto the House floor. And I'm very proud of that. The, the bipartisan working group has had a number of pieces of legislation. Um, I'm gonna go through some of them. I mean, the one is the Employee Act. And here's what I said, when I, was a, when I was in business, when I had the car dealership, I'll never forget, people were coming to the dealership. We needed employees, they were unemployed. They would come in, they'd say, how much, can I make? And we would tell them and they'd say, well, I'll come back in 10, 15, 20 weeks, 40 weeks, whatever. And I always thought that was a problem. We shouldn't be paying unemployment. We should be paying reemployment. We should be making sure that those that don't have the necessary skills get those skills. And we should be using those dollars to reemploy people. And I brought that to the, uh, the bipartisan group and they agreed and both Republicans and Democrats signed on to what we call the Employee Act, which actually got a lot of traction and then ultimately became part of, a, of the, um, uh, the payroll tax extension law that was passed. And it became an, an act which basically said that the states can take unemployment dollars and use those dollars for reemployment, for training. And what a great idea. I mean, and it was, it was really a win-win for our bipartisan group. It gives an opportunity. Now, the states don't have to do it. There's uh, an opportunity for 10 states out of 50 to apply for this waiver to see what would happen. And ultimately, we kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Now, guess what happened after that law got out? Well, the administrative bureaucracy got a hold of it. And the next thing we found out was that Texas, who really wanted to use this program, decided, I'm walking away from it, it's too difficult. There's too many regulations, there's too many requirements, there's a problem with it, it's a good idea. Ohio, same thing, we tried to push Ohio, Ohio says, you know what, way too many requirements. So ultimately, John Carney and I just actually filed a bill last week 
which we call the, um, I forget the actual name of it, the, oh, the Flexibility to Promote Reemployment Act. And what we said was, all right, we're going to fix that problem. Again, one of the problems in Washington, you've got to continue to fix problems. But this was because the administration had made it so complicated for states to use this program that we thought we better figure out a way to change that. So we just filed that. It's now being supported by the bipartisan group. A couple other bills, the Vulnerable Veterans Housing Reform Act of 2013, the Veterans Advisory Committee on Education Improvement Act. Again, veterans issues, very important. These are things that are a core to our bipartisan group, and these are bills that we're all signed on to and we're pushing through the House. Um, the flexibility to, uh, well, we talked about that one. The Budget Process Improvement Act, here's a great one. This is where we say, you know, instead of doing a budget every year, you hear about these battles every year, let's do one every two years. We have Congress in session for two years, let's do a two-year budget. And then let's start to look, here's the kind of interesting thing, and this was brought up by one of the Democrats, so I learned something in, in our meetings. What, what you find out in Washington is that everything's based on 10-year cycles. So when, you, when, when we do budgets, if you notice, everything's 10 years, 10 years, 10 years. There's a reason for that. That's because that's, by law, how long we can establish things for 10 years. So guess what happens? Guess where all the bad stuff ends up happening in the 11th year? So if you take an example, the uh, Affordable Care Act, you should see what happens in the 11th year. I mean, we already have problems in the second, third, and fourth year, but everything gets pushed off to the 11th year. But it, I can give you other bills that are the same thing. So what we said was, let's do 20 years. So you can't hide something in the 11th year. Now, the answer would be, well, they'll probably put it in the 21st year. But quite frankly, 21st year is a long way out. Um, it makes you be a little bit more uh, specific when you're doing those budgeting issues. Uh, Security Clearance Protection Act of 2013 of Returning Investment to American Act. How about this great idea? Let's take all those dollars that are overseas and let's allow the companies to bring them back tax-free as long as they put them in jobs, new jobs, property, plant, and equipment in America. How about that as an idea that came out of the bipartisan group? Now, these are things that I think are so important because, as I said, it's Republicans and Democrats working together because I think in Washington we can agree that none of these problems, and I said this before, are Republican problems or Democrat problems. They're America problems. We have to fix them. We have to come up with solutions. The other interesting thing that's come out of the bipartisan group is I have so many friends on the other side that John Carney actually came to Cleveland, and I don't know, so you never hear any of this stuff, but he actually came and we had a, a town hall. So I actually, and people would say, I've never seen a town hall with a Republican and Democrat standing up on the stage. Well, John Carney came to Cleveland in Middleburg Heights, and we had a town hall uh, where we talked about issues that affect Americans. And it was a great town hall, and I've committed to go to his district and actually speak with him. So these are opportunities that I think can occur when Republicans and Democrats work together. Now, let me tell you some of the problems in Washington, because people always say, well, it's so political, and you're right, it's political. Um, but think about this. Here's what happens, and we'll talk about the debt ceiling vote. Speaker Boehner tried his hardest to make sure that we had an agreement on the debt ceiling that included items that'll fix the drivers of the debt. Let's face it, we shouldn't just be raising the debt ceiling, we should be attaching things to it that fix things going forward. We can't continue to raise the debt ceiling. We're going to continue to give our children and our grandchildren nothing but more debt. So let's figure out ways when we raise it to be able to fix something. And that's what was so important to me. And what we found was the Democrats said, we're not voting for anything. And quite frankly, because I have friends on the other side, the answer was, we're all going to hold together and force you guys to do something. Now that's a problem. That's a problem in Washington. And guess what? When the Republicans are the minority, they did the same thing. So I'm not going to exclude them from it. I can only tell you what's going on now. So think about it. You have 433 votes, 233 Republicans, 200 Democrats. All 200 Democrats vote no. Now I've got some friends over there. And they will tell you that some of these bills are pretty good, but they hold their no vote. When you're in the minority, you hold your no vote. 
The Republicans, when they were in their minority, held their no vote. They forced the majority to get something accomplished. If you want to talk about frustration, that's frustrating for me. Because then you need 217 votes to get anything accomplished. Now you know 233 less 217, I mean you can't lose too many votes to get anything accomplished. And that's what happens in Washington. So people will say, well, I don't blame the far right. You know what I say? There's some blame that goes on the far right, but there's also some blame that goes on the minority party because the American people should be saying, there's something wrong with that system. You should be voting for what's best for the country and your district. And when you do that, you're going to cross party lines. That's the problem. That's where we run into so many issues in Washington. Washington's broken because politics gets in the way of good policy. It's that simple. We do have a lot of good policy coming from both sides of the aisle, but politics gets in the way. Again, if I could fix things, that would be one thing I would definitely fix. That's why the bipartisan working group is so important. What the bipartisan working group gets gives us the opportunity to get out of that fray and to start making some good decisions. Now here's what's interesting. When we had the government shutdown, you'd be surprised. Not only did our bipartisan group work together and try and come up with solutions. In fact, John Delaney from Maryland, a Democrat, and myself were on national TV, but I'll bet you didn't see it. Because we were on national TV talking about how to, how to come back and fix things and what we should be doing. And we were talking about how we need to reform Social Security. We were talking about how we need to look at some of the entitlement programs. We were talking about how we need to re get, make sure education's back in the, in the budget. All these things, but I guarantee you never heard about it. You know why? It's not sensational. You have a Republican and Democrat working together. That's not news. I mean, it should be news, don't get me wrong, but it's not gonna sell commercials, and I think that's one of the problems in Washington. That's clearly one of the problems in Washington. Now, here's one of the things that I think is the biggest problem in Washington, and actually the bipartisan work, you're gonna hear about it over the next month or so. If you think about it, anybody here that's in the business world, or even your family, the first thing you do is you gotta decide what are your assets and what are your liabilities? How much am I spending? And what can I do to change things? Well, if you think about it, in Washington, first thing I did when I got there was I said, you know what? Let's see what travel expense is. Let's take something easy. So I was there only a couple months, and I said, let's, let's try and figure out what's in the travel budget. I want to see what everybody's spending. You know, it's three years now. I still haven't figured that out. <laughs> that tells you something. It's gotten too big that we can't even tell what our travel expense is. So what I really started working on was I said, well, you know what? If we can't do our travel expense, I want to see a balance sheet. I want to figure out what, this, what the country's balance sheet looks like. So I, it took me about a year and a half to find that. Now think about it. As a member of Congress, you should have, you know what your first thing should be? You should be handed the balance sheet of the United States of America, and you should be told, study this, because this is the most important document other than the Constitution, this is the most important document you're going to have to work off of. But we don't get that. In fact, I guarantee you most members in Washington wouldn't even know what the balance sheet looked like. And quite frankly, when I saw it, it's not a balance sheet. Now here's what's so interesting. And I'll give President Clinton credit for this. Back in the 90s, President Clinton said, we've got to get a balance sheet. We've got to start getting audited financial statements. And he started down a process of setting up an outside organization called FaceApp, which actually decides how the balance sheet should look. And quite frankly, it took me a while to find that organization. I finally found the executive director, had a lot of good conversations, but everything takes time in Washington. And uh, what I learned was she was even happy that I found her. Um, FaceApp is an organization that has, now remember who, the. Treasury is the one who produces the financial statements. The Treasury um, sits on the board of FaceApp. And guess what? They can trump anything that FaceApp decides as a presentation on the financial statements. Now think about that. So you have an independent organization. Clinton was trying. I've got to give Pre President Clinton a lot, of, a lot of credit. He was trying. But this little organization called FaceApp 
basically presents a financial statement isn't it, that truly, in my opinion, isn't the true picture. It's not an accrual-based financial statement. And by the way, the financial statements are not auditable at this point in time. So if you think about it, we have a federal government that's presenting financial statements that aren't all inclusive anyway. They're based on FaceApp and they're not audible. That's a problem. And that's the one thing that the bipartisan group is going to be working on in the next couple months. We've already got the legislation. We believe it's important. And I got to tell you, whether you're a progressive liberal, which one of the members on our bipartisan group is um, from Vermont, Peter Welsh, he loves the idea. He says, you know what? This is something the American people should require and request. This is how important it is. Or whether you're a moderate, moderate Democrat or a, a far-right Republican, whatever, wherever you lean, we should have that. And that's the thing we're working on. I'll tell you another thing we're working on, which I think is so important. And again, we're doing this out of the bipartisan group. I think it's March 16th we're going to sit down. We took members from the Democrat side and the Republican side and said, uh, there's, there's a group out there called Fix the Debt. And, it's a compute, and they've spent so much time developing a program with all the line items of things we could do to fix the growing debt and fix the growing deficit. There's some tough, tough, tough issues, but they're all spelled out. They're all laid out for us to make the decisions. So what we've agreed to do as, bi as a bipartisan working group is we're going to have at least five members on the Democrat side and five members on the Republican side come up with their answer on how to fix the debt. Now, what the Fix the Debt organization says is we've got to cut about $2 trillion in the next 10 years. So we have to figure out a way to do that. Now, cuts or add revenue, I should say it that way. And I think what's going to happen here, it's going to be very interesting because on March 12th or 15th, whatever day it is, we're going to come together and four or five Democrats are going to all individually, not working together, all individually, present their plan, and four or five Republicans, myself being included, individually are going to present our plan. And you know when you put that matrix together, there's going to be something that we all agree to, and then we're going to really push to move forward as a bipartisan group. So that's another thing that we're working on, which shows you that members from both sides can get things accomplished, as long as politics doesn't get in the way of policy. And that's the most important thing. So I'm very happy that uh, I have the opportunity to be able to work with colleagues from both sides of the aisle. And I will tell you this, the one thing I wish I, I, we were able to get more from the president, I mean, a lot of people say, you know, you don't like the president. You, I like the president. He's a nice guy. But one thing I don't like about the president is I've never seen him come over to the House or Senate and try and work with us. Now, as a businessman for 30 years, I always believed if people disagree with me, I want to go talk to them. I want to, you know, whether I agree or disagree, I want to understand why. I've only, the president's only been over to see us one time in three years. Now you realize John F. Kennedy came over all the time. Bill Clinton came over, I heard, all the time. George W. Bush, like him or not, came over the House and Senate all the time to talk to members. And Ronald Reagan, when he passed the uh, tax reform, he used to come to individual offices and say, hey, Renacy, not me, but I need to talk to you about what you're thinking about on this tax reform. That's the kind of president Ronald Reagan was. And we need that. We need that going forward. We need to have presidents that are willing to come over to the other side and realize that we may disagree, but maybe there's some common ground that we can work on and get some things done. In closing, before we take questions, I'll tell you that I'm, um, I'm honored to be on the Ways and Means Committee. The Ways and Means Committee is, is considered one of the most powerful committees in, in the House of Representatives. I think there are a number of presidents that have come out of the Ways and Means. Paul Ryan sits on that uh, committee. The reason I bring that up is we are attempting, and you're going to hear about that this year, to roll out a tax reform plan. This tax reform plan, let's face it, we have one of the most complicated tax reform tax systems in the world. We have the highest tax rate in the world, and we need to make sure that our tax system is less complicated, but also works to grow the economy and becomes better for business, but also better for individuals, so that 
it's simpler, it takes less time, and we can get some things accomplished. And you're going to be surprised that on a bipartisan basis, basis and I give the chairman, Chairman Camp, credit for this, he took Republicans and Democrats, made them, everybody sit together in different sessions. We talked about international, we talked about small business, and then we listened to outsiders who came in. And what you're going to see come from uh, the, the uh, tax reform that will be introduced hopefully sometime this year. The only reason it's not introduced yet is because politics gets in the way of good policy. Um, but when we get the opportunity to get policy in front of politics, we're going to roll out a, a tax reform plan, which I really think you're all going to say there's going to be some things you like, some things you don't like. But ultimately, the goal is to get the rates from 35 to 25 across the board um, and have a, have two, a two-tier system, 25 and 10, make it simpler. And by the way, when it scores, it actually scores more revenue, which isn't that surprising. That when you reduce the rates, you score more revenue. And uh, we're going to, you know, the scoring, when it comes out, you'll be able to see, um, show that. And remember, who scores it? It's a nonpartisan group who frustrates both sides. But... When we see the scoring, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. So that's going to be the goal for this year, not only of my Ways and Means Committee, uh, but the bipartisan group. And again, it's been an honor for me to talk with you this, uh, this afternoon, and I know we're going to open it up for some questions. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday Forum featuring Jim Renacci, Congressional Representative of Ohio's 16th District. We'll return to him momentarily for a question and answer period. We'll have about 19 minutes or so for questions. And we'd encourage you to start formulating your questions now. And please keep them brief and to the point and phrase them actually as questions. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via broadcast on WVIZ PBS, 90.3 WCPN, and 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream. WTAM, or one of our many broadcast partners across the country. Broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Today, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the law firm Baker and Hostetler, Cuyahoga Community College, Jim Renacci for Congress, the Philpott Rubber Company of Brunswick, the Republican Party of Cuyahoga County, University Hospitals, and Walsh University. Thank you all for your support. Today's forum is the Bolton Memorial Forum on National Politics, made possible by a special gift from the Payne Fund in memory of Congressman Chester C. Bolton, Congresswoman Frances P. Bolton, and Congressman Oliver P. Bolton. Joining us today is Charles Bolton, and I know you stood once, but I'm going to ask you again to do so again and be recognized. Okay, you can wave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Today's forum is sponsored by the Northeast Ohio Media Group, the City Club's official sponsor of political and policy forums. Thank you for your support. We welcome students to today's program. Student participation is made possible by a generous gift from the Jeffrey David Epstein Memorial Fund. Joining us today are students from Brecksville Broadview Heights High School. Will our students please stand and be recognized? On Wednesday, February 19th, the City Club will host an annual State of the County Address with County Executive Ed Fitzgerald at the Cleveland Convention Center. We hold it there to accommodate a larger crowd. Tickets, I understand, are still available. And a week from today, the City Club will host a panel discussion on guns and common ground. For more information about our upcoming forums to make a reservation or to order a CD or DVD of today's program, please refer to our website, and that's www.cityclub.org. Now, as promised, we'd like to return to our speaker for a Q&A period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are our City Club Program Director, Kerry Miller, and Administrative Assistant, Kirsten Pianca. First question, please. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Renacci, for coming today. Um, I wanted to ask a question uh, based on uh, districting for Congress. Um, I think it's probably evident to most of us here that uh, districting has become more and more partisan and that 
uh, districts are, there's more increasing number of safe districts for representatives. So uh, seeing that districts have become more and more polarized largely because of this redistricting, would you support um, urging the states to consider less polarizing ways of setting these district lines? What is interesting, and quite frankly, uh, for me, it's an easy answer because I actually ran in a very tight district in 2010 and also again in 2012. So ultimately, it's an easy answer for me. I don't care what the district looks like. I'm a firm believer that you need to represent the people. Um, whoever is in that district, when the, when the district included Wayne, Stark, Medina, and Ashland, I shook everybody's hand, whether it was a Republican or Democrat, they got to know me, and quite frankly, I think I won over a lot of Democrats at that time because I won by 12 percentage points. When the biggest problem in a redistricting is the first year people don't know you that well and they got to get to know you. So ultimately, I think that's a state issue and I do think that the states need to look at that. You're exactly right. There are probably only 40, 40 to 50 max out of 435 districts that uh, would be considered competitive. Um, and the other districts aren't. So. The, the Republican who's there or the Democrats there is there as long as they want to be there unless they do something wrong. And I really think no matter what district, I'm going to reverse that though, I really think the people of the district need to get to know the representative better. And even if it's an R plus 16 or a D plus 16, if the Republican or Democrat is not doing their job, I don't think it matters how the districts are, are drawn up. I think it's more important that the people get work together to put somebody in there who truly represents that district. Next question. Congressman, thank you for taking the time with us this afternoon. Um, from one certified public accountant to another certified public accountant, I take great comfort in knowing that there is at least one sane member in our Ohio delegation. You know, there's only eight, eight CPAs in the 400 and some delegation and, and it's I think I think they need more because our financial situation is very complex I'm the chief financial officer of the Philpot rubber company it's a 125 year old company that began business down the street about a mile way back in 1889 and as I've gone through our tax returns over the last century I've seen that the tax code has become very complex from one or two pages to hundreds of pages with our tax return. And we're not a big public company, and our tax return is a monster. And I was just wondering, you, you serve on the Ways and Means Committee, and is there a way, you know, we would love to pay more taxes with a lower tax rate. We'd love for the business activity to pick up so that we could make more money and pay more taxes with a lower rate. Why? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think that's the, the goal, and quite frankly, if you think about it, people say that the reason jobs move overseas is because of labor costs. Here's one of the issues, excluding labor costs. Let's take labor costs out of the mix. The National Manufacturing Association says, and I would agree, that it's 20% less costly to do business outside of this country than it is to do business in this country. And you say, well, where's that 20% come from? Well, first off, the tax rate. It's 35%. The, the next highest tax rate is 25%. That's in Japan. So it's 10% more expensive. That's one of your costs if you're running the business. 10% more expensive to do business in this country. The other 10% comes from regulations. We have so many, by the way, you ought to, you ought to start really looking at, you, you realize there's been so many regulations, but there's nothing to take the old regulations away. So what do we keep doing in Washington? We add more and more and more. Sometimes they conflict with the old, but nobody ever gets rid of the old ones. There's our 20%. That's why it's so important for us to hold regulations. That doesn't mean get rid of them. There are some good regulations. We need to limit the overreach of governmental regulations, and we need to simplify the tax return and the tax rate so that whether you're a C Corp, an S Corp, an LLC, whatever you are, your tax rate should be at least at a competitive rate of 25%. And I think that's important. That's going to be the goal of the committee moving forward. 
Uh, Congressman, thank you as well. And I'm a CPA as well. <laughs> I think there's more here than in all of Congress uh, today. Uh, so staying on the tax theme and the business theme, you, you mentioned about uh, your own ways and mean, and I believe you said the House and the Senate are meeting to, or committees are meeting to reform the tax code. Uh, with this being tax season, I've seen a lot of small business owners, and you've talked a lot about maybe more C-Corp taxes, but uh, with the 39.6 rate now, with the Obamacare taxes, the net investment tax, and we're seeing federal income tax rates as high as 44% before you count Ohio and local tax here, easily up to a 50 or 50% more tax rate for small business owners. Um, is, your, is this committee going to address the small business side? Uh, bringing down those rates both uh, at the S-Corp level and for individual taxpayers? And does the administration have buy-in? Because Congress can do all this, but if it's not ultimately signed by the president, uh, it would not happen. So is there buy-off also from the administration? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, our goal is to make sure whether you're C-Corp, S-Corp, LLC, no matter how you run your business, that your highest rate is 25%. And I will tell you, the president's already indicated his goal is to bring um, C corps down to 25 percent, but he's not addressing everything else. And the problem with that, quite frankly, is that when 60 some percent of our businesses, uh, small businesses, are, are run as L uh, LLCs, S corps, um, it's important that we get all the rates down to 25 percent. So our goal, which conflicts with the president's, is to bring everybody down to 25 percent. He just wants to bring the uh, C-Corp rates down to 25%. That's where we have to be able to work together. I actually think when, when we're done and we do our presentation of the tax reform that we want to present and we do the scoring, it's going to be a hard no vote even for the president, but that's when politics gets in the way of good policy. So hopefully, uh, you know, when Reagan, back in 1986, did the massive tax reform, he worked to make sure that everybody was involved, and I hope the president does the same thing. Next question. Uh, I had two questions. <clears throat> uh, how much of our national debt of 17 trillion do you think we should try to bring down? And do you indeed think that we could cut two or three trillion dollars over, let's say, 10 years without raising taxes? Um, I would tell you this, if you look at the fix the debt model that was done by an outside nonpartisan group, the answer is yes. Um, there have to be some reforms to do that. Uh, but remember, growth doesn't have to come from raising taxes. That's one of the fallacies. Everybody believes the only way to get revenue growth is to raise taxes. I think you're going to be shocked when you see that the scoring of a lower tax rate, and again, this is a nonpartisan group that does the scoring, I think you're going to find that the revenues do go up. You know one of the interesting things about this year? We will have our highest revenue ever out of the Treasury this year. The highest revenue ever will come in from the Treasury. The problem was we're also spending some of the highest levels ever too. So ultimately, keep in mind that we're going to have to look at what we're doing because all we're doing is adding that debt. And are there reforms? There is waste that needs to be addressed. There are reforms that need to be addressed. And quite frankly, if we don't ever look at the drivers of our debt, which people I think now are starting to realize, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are the drivers of the debt, we need to make sure Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are around for the future. But at the same time, we need to take a look at a program that was established 40 years ago based on people's life expectancy of 66. And quite frankly, as you know, the life expectancy today is much higher. So we have a program out there that's flawed. And until we're willing to look at those programs, we're never going to fix the debt. And that really has to be the key. Um, how do we fix those programs so they're around for the future, so they're around for our children and grandchildren? Um, and, and that's where we have to look. Hi, Congressman Renacy. Um, I'm here with fellow seniors in high school, and one of our biggest concerns is the price of college education. And I was wondering how your bipartisan group could help to lower college education through maybe federal programs or even state programs, because it's really expensive. <laughs> Well, it is really expensive, and quite frankly, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. I, what I'm trying to do is figure out what's driving the cost. There are some that say, there are some that say that because we have so many student loans and grants, that's what's driving the cost up. I mean, and I'm not saying that's the answer, that's what I'm hearing. 
So I'm trying to evaluate what's causing. Remember, as there's more money available and more people are going in, the price goes up, and that's one of the issues. So we've got to look at that. But ultimately, we have to look at what's driving the, the price of education because the most important way to fix our economy is jobs. Look, if, we, if, if, we just, if all we did was dedicate the next year to job creation and job growth, you would see we wouldn't have to raise any taxes. You would see an increase in revenue. And uh, quite frankly, we'd probably be able to have better education. And th this is what's so important because education is also going to help be the driver of these jobs. But look around at some of the places that are doing well. Look at some of the states. I mean, go to North Dakota. North Dakota is booming right now. Why are they booming? Because of jobs. We have to make sure that jobs is the key. Hi, um, as a uh, businessman and a CPA, could you comment about the correlation between a stagnant economy and uh, uncertainty? And then also maybe give a specific example in a, one of the companies you had or another one out there. Sure. Uh, that's a good question because I tell people today, and I've not only heard this, I've not only said this, I've heard this from other entrepreneurs. Look, I was an entrepreneur that was willing to risk capital. Ask my wife how many times I came to her and said, we're going to risk some capital to move forward. And uh, I was willing to do that because I had a little bit more certainty and predictability 30 years ago. I would never risk capital today. That's a problem. And why wouldn't I do that? Because we're lacking, as you said, certainty and predictability. Nobody in this room can tell us what our health care costs are going to be a year from now. Some people will say, I saw this economist that say they're going to go down. Quite frankly, facts are, when I go around my district, they're going up. Health care costs are going up 40%, 60%. So the, you know, and then um, deductibles are going up. So that's also going to drive the, the, the uh, the inability for people to be able to pay for health insurance. So these are some of the issues that bring some certainty and unpredictable. Nobody knows what our, whether our tax code is going to be fixed or not fixed. It's complicated. We need to bring certainty and predictability. And by the way, nobody knows what the next regulation is going to be. I mean, if all of a sudden you opened up a business and you were just making it, and you were just barely making it, and you had minimum wage employees, to use them as an example, and all of a sudden, that the, you were concerned that the minimum wage was going to go up and that would put you in a law situation, what are you going to do? These are things that we have to work on making sure that not only small businesses, but individuals know what their government, what certainty and predictability is coming out of the government. So we need to be able to do that. And that's why I say when I go back to my career, I mean, look, health insurance went up every year when I was in business. But I was able to, I was able to look at 8 to 11 percent increases. And by the way, when I employed, at one point in time, I employed up to 3,000 people. I always said this, I doubt I had very, I might have had some minimum wage, but I doubt I had very many, if any. I always provided in those businesses um, health insurance, and I also provided 401k because I think savings is another important thing that we have to make sure that our children and our grandchildren realize that if you put some money aside, whether it's in a 401k or whatever, those are going to be very important for you in the future. So um, this certainty and predictability is such a key to going forward and something that I'm so concerned about. And that's why we, you know, if I could raise the magic wand, I'd, reduce, I'd make sure that our tax rates were competitive. I'd make sure that regulations were held, at least to the current level, and nothing else increased for a while until job growth. By the way, these are all bills that we've put out. You know, the interesting thing is the House of Representatives has over 100 and some bills over in the Senate that the Senate has not even addressed. And that's another problem because some of these things that we're talking about, we have addressed and we've pushed over to the Senate. So, um, but that's the most scary thing. I would not risk capital today as I did 30 years ago. Uh, Congressman, forgive me, I'm extremely nervous and I've been stressing for the past 15 minutes. The way you solve the problems with Social Security is just combine them with the government pensions. Then we wouldn't have a problem. But my real question is this. With respect to Obamacare, the Republicans have lost the past 40 or 41 times. We're not gaining any momentum. Why don't they approach it from the basis of the initial discussion where Obama lied 
and Congress knew it when they were writing the law, go back to the integrity of it rather than the laws where it's a freebie for everybody. Because I think that way you could increase the people supporting changing Obamacare because we're not doing too well as it stands right now. Well, it's interesting, and I, and I would agree with you, and, and don't be nervous. I used to be nervous when I got up here, too. Now it's easy, because when you just talk the truth like you just did, it's very important. Here's what we have. We have a system that's not working. We have 52% of the people now that are unhappy with the president's health care plan. I give him credit. He put the good things out first, which we should have addressed, pre-existing conditions, caps on medical insurance, raising, you know, allowing your children to stay on the plan to age 26. Those are all the good things. Those came out first. The bad things are starting to roll out now. And what happened was we had a speaker at the time who said, we need to pass it to see what's in it. Well, quite frankly, that's not a good answer. Because what we're finding out now is that there are some problems. And I knew there were going to be some problems with it, too. So the American people continue to want us to repeal it. 52% want us to repeal it. Now, we realize we're not going to repeal it as long as the president's there. But keep in mind, I'll get back to what I said about the president trying to work with the president. In December, actually on December 3rd, my birthday, the president had a speech where he said, if anybody in Congress has any ideas, I'd like to hear about them and I'd be willing to meet with them. I was one of 33 members who signed a letter and said, Mr. President, we have some ideas we'd like to talk to you about. It's February 14th and we haven't heard back from them. And that's the problem. So if we're going to work together, it's got to be on both sides. Isn't it amazing that the president is unilaterally changing the, his own health care plan when it's law, but he won't listen to us on some changes we should make? Thank you. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Congressman Jim Renacci, representative of Ohio's 16th Congressional District. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.